Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar of FIO Africa and the Facility webinar series. My name is Georgia Caradimo. I am a geologist and I'm working as Earth Observation Scientist at CERCO in Italy. Today, during this session, you will have the chance to learn how you can map a flood using Sentinel-1 data. And I will guide you through this session where I will provide you some theoretical knowledge about floods in general, and more specifically about the flood uh, that occurred in Malawi in January 2015. After this, uh, I will also give you a short demo on uh, how you can process the Sentinel-1 data within the Innovation Lab uh, using uh, all the open source software available in there. And just to let you know, in case you're not aware, Innovation Lab is the cloud infrastructure provided by the EU Africa R&D facility. And there is already an available webinar in the YouTube channel of the facility introducing you to cloud computing for Earth observation analysis. Well, you can check it afterwards if you want, uh, and I will give you in a while more information about this too. So if everyone is ready, I think we can start. And just let me share my screen. I will turn off the camera to focus on the presentation though. We will start from the brief introduction to EO Africa project, a EO Africa R&D facility. Then I will give you an overview on floods, their definition, the flood events in Africa, and more specifically in Malawi. After this, I will give you some information about the Sentinel-1 data that we will use for mapping this flood event, and we will continue with the demo session that I mentioned before. Finally, we will end with the conclusions of this topic, and I will give you some information about the upcoming webinars and events of the facility, and we will have a live Q&A session. About this, please write your questions at the Q&A tab within this meeting, and we will answer them live at the end. I would like to remind you that this session is being recorded so that you can watch it again later on YouTube, and it will last in total about one hour. Now I will briefly introduce you EO Africa facility. First of all, EO Africa stands for African Framework for Research, Innovation, Communities and Applications, Building an African-European R&D Partnership. One of the activities under EO Africa is EO Africa R&D facility. It is a flagship program of the EO Africa initiative with an overarching long-term goal for supporting an African-European collaboration. The activity complements other programs such as GMES in Africa to enable an active research community and creative innovation processes for a continuous development of Earth observation capabilities in Africa. This project is being developed by six partners, as you can see below. University of Twente, as the leader of the project, and we also have CS Group France and CS Romania, CERCO, TUVN, and VITO. Altogether, the six partners are going to implement EO Africa R&D facility within three years. Based on the ESA's previous experience of the TIGER initiative that provided capacity building, through research in Africa in the last 15 years. And now we have your Africa in RD facility that continues this work. There are three main activities that EO Africa RD facility is going to implement within the three first years of the project. The first one is providing a cloud based earth observation data analysis environment to support researchers in accessing and utilizing Earth observation data. So the Cloud Computing Power platform has been developed, which is called Innovation Lab, and we provide this platform to African and European researchers to be able to perform joint research using Earth observation data in Africa. We also offer technical and financial support for 30 research studies to address African Earth observation research challenges related to water scarcity and food security. 
The last activity is establishing a digital capacity development platform to provide domain-specific training, and it is established via Space Academy, where we'll provide face-to-face -face and online courses, webinars, training modules, as well as MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. Okay, uh, let me give you now a short introduction about this webinar. This webinar will focus on the importance and use of Sentinel-1 SAR data for flood mapping. With Sentinel-1 SAR data, we can map and analyze the affected flooded areas over a region that may not be easily accessible and even compare them with the official flood maps. Let's pass now to the definition of a flood. A flood is an overflow of water onto normally dry land which is the indention of a normally dry area caused by rising water in an existing waterway, such as a river, a stream, or a drainage ditch. It is ponding of water at or near the point where the rain fell. Flooding is a longer term event than flash flooding. It may last days or weeks. Now, Flash flood is a flood caused by heavy or excessive rainfall in a short period of time, generally less than six hours. Flash floods are usually characterized by raging torrents after heavy rains that rip through riverbeds, urban streets, or mountain canyons, sweeping everything before them. They can occur within minutes or a few hours of excessive rainfall. They can also occur even if uh, no rainfall has fallen, for instance, after a leaf or dam has failed or after a sudden release of water by a debris or ice jam. Some more details about floods. As we said, flood is an overflow of water, or rarely even other fluids, that submerges land that is usually dry. Floods are an area of study of the discipline hydrology and are of significant concern in agriculture, civil engineering, and public health. Human changes to the environment often increase the intensity and frequency of flooding. For example, land use changes, uh, such as deforestation and removal of wetlands, changes in waterway course or flood controls such as um, with leaves and larger environmental issues like climate change and sea level rise. In particular, climate changes increased rainfall and extreme weather events increase the severity of other causes for flooding. And this results in more intense floods and increased flood risk. Flooding may occur as an overflow of water from water bodies, such as a river, lake, or ocean, in which the water overtops uh, or breaks leaves, resulting in some of the water to escape its usual boundaries. Or it may occur due to an accumulation of rainwater or saturated grout uh, in a real flood. While the size of a lake or other body of water will vary with seasonal changes in precipitation and snow melt, these changes in size are unlikely to be considered significant unless they flood property or drawn domestic animals. Since January 2022, the floods that affected most of Africa killed nearly 2,000 people. The worst affected country was Nigeria with over 610 deaths. In January, in Malawi, six houses collapsed and 126 others were damaged because of this flood. Tropical Storm Anna caused 37 deaths in the country, while Cyclone Gombe in March caused further seven deaths. Back to 2015 and the case study we will focus on today. The Republic of Malawi declared half of the country a state of disaster on 13 January 2015 in the 15 affected districts out of the total 28 districts. 
After a long draw during uh, December 2014, Malawi received very heavy rainfall for several weeks in January. It is some of the worst flooding that Malawi has ever experienced, um, and it's unexpected to result in a long process of recovery due to the disaster's impact on infrastructure and agriculture, with estimated costs of about $51 million to repair the damage. The following southern districts were the most once affected. The area that experienced heavy rains, uh, more than 150% of normal rainfall throughout December and January, partially related to Cyclone Bansi and the tropical storm Cesda, which led to severe flooding. The flood left 276 people dead and estimated around 230,000 displaced, with some areas completely inaccessible. It also caused extensive damages to crops, livestock and infrastructure, with estimated 64,000 hectares of land damaged, which further deepened the humanitarian disaster. Malawi in particular prone to adverse climate hazards that include dry spells, seasonal droughts, intense rainfall, river rain floods, and flash floods. Drones and floods, the most severe of these hazards, have increased in frequency, intensity, and magnitude over the past 20 years, with consequences on food and water security, water quality, energy resources, and sustainable livelihoods of the most rural communities. From 1979 to 2008, 2,596 people perished due to natural disasters and nearly another 21.7 million people were affected. In general, floods and droughts are the leading cause of chronic food security, which is endemic in many parts of this country. Let's check now why is Malawi vulnerable to floods. One of the main reasons for floods in Malawi is the rainfall characteristics. Rainfall is variable, erratic, and rainfall in the highlands often causes floods in the low-lying areas. Also, extensive deforestation increases runoff and the overall flood risk. Malawi is the third poorest country in the world. About half of the population lives below the poverty line. These two regions you see that have been particularly affected by the floods are the poorest in the country. Over 80% of Malawians rely on agriculture. Most are smallholder farmers. With their livelihoods reliant on a single rain-fed season, they are particularly vulnerable to floods. Recent research shows that the smallholder farmers lose 2.67% of their agricultural produce to flooding each year. High levels of poverty, a lack of access to land, and a growing population means people have smaller pieces of land for farming. This has led to settlements in marginalized areas that are prone to flooding. Another factor contributing to people's vulnerability is that housing and infrastructure are of poor quality. In addition, there is a lack of economic desertification, employment opportunities and access to social services. And this means that people are limited in how they can prepare for a possible flood and bounce back after it's happened. We will now pass to the main types of floods. First, the flash floods are fast-moving waters that sweep everything in their path. They are caused by heavy rainfall or rapid snow, though. Floods usually cover a relatively small area and occur with little to no notice, generally less than six hours, and the rapid water torrents can move large objects such as car, rocks, and trees. Second, the coastal floods. 
They are caused by strong winds or storms that move towards a coast during high tide. When powerful waves breach the coast dune or dike, the area is usually flooded. Coastal areas with fewer defenses and lower elevation are the most affected. For this reason, the best time to repair the bridge is during low tide. Third are the river floods. They are characterized by gradual river bank overflows caused by extensive rainfall over an extended period of time. The areas covered by river floods depend on the size of the river and the amount of rainfall. River floods rarely result in loss of lives, but can cause immense economic damage. Fourth are the urban floods. They occur when the drainage system in a city or town fails to absorb the water from heavy rain. The lack of natural drainage in an urban area can also contribute to flooding. Water flows out into the street, making driving quite dangerous. Although water levels can be just a few centimeters deep, urban floods can cause significant structural damage. Last are the pluvial floods. They form in flat areas where the terrain can't absorb the rainwater, causing puddles and ponds to appear. Pluvial flooding is similar to urban flooding, but it occurs mostly in rural areas. The agricultural activities and properties in areas where uh, pluvial floods have occurred can be seriously affected. In this slide, you can see an illustration of the factors that contribute to the floods. And if you're interested, at the top of this uh, page, there is this link that you can get more information on the causes of floods in general. Here you can also check out a list available of the deadliest floods in history. And I think it is worth it to mention the importance of studying floods and not only um, floods, especially with satellite data, by quoting Noti et al. 2018, as they mention in, the, in their scientific paper, um, Potential and Limitations of Open Satellite Data for Flood Mapping. So, every year, Flood events cause great economic losses and victims. For this reason, precise flood mapping and modeling are essential for flood hazard assessment, damage estimation, and sustainable urban planning to properly manage flood risk. In such a context, satellite remote sensing is currently a low-cost tool that can be profitably exploited for flood mapping. And after this, let's talk about the satellites available for flood mapping. Satellite remote sensing is a powerful tool to map flooded areas. In recent years, the availability of free satellite data significantly increased in terms of type and frequency, allowing the production of flood maps at low cost around the world. In this work, we propose a semi-automatic uh, method for flood mapping based only on free satellite images and open source software. In recent years, the increased availability of uh, free of charge satellite data has allowed the study of many natural and human-made processes at low cost and has boosted research in many fields. For instance, the Sentinel satellite constellation of the Copernicus program provides synthetic aperture radar SAR, and multispectral data with global coverage, high frequency pass, and high spatial resolution. Other examples of free remote sensing programs are Landsat, which has provided data since 1972, and the MODIS daily satellites giving multispectral images. These data are often available uh, with the first level of atmospheric or radiometric calibration, allowing their use by different types of users and not only experts in remote sensing processing. Extraction of flooded areas can be performed by using multispectral satellite data and their derived indices, SAR images, or a combination of this data. Other types of satellite data 
can be useful to improve the flood mapping, uh, for instance, the digital elevation models derived from uh, satellite data, uh, or uh, the shuttle radar topography mission, the SRTM and ASTER, can be also used to estimate flood prone areas or to improve a SAR or multispectral data based map. In addition, water storage data from the GRACE satellite or soil moisture data from ASCAT to derive flood indicators. Each remote sensing technique for flood mapping presents both advantages and drawbacks. So they must be evaluated on case-by-case -case basis. Sentinel-1 now has contributed to eight disaster response efforts in Malawi following the devastated floods which affected the Southern African region in 2015 in January. Sentinel-1, with its radar instrument, is a valuable tool for flood monitoring, as radar imagery can be used to easily distinguish areas of water from land. The acquisition of radar data is also unaffected by local weather conditions and clouds, enabling monitoring of a disaster area even during periods of stormy weather. At this chart on the right, you can see that amongst the different natural hazards, floods account for almost half of the weather-related disasters recorded during the last 20 years. Earth observation satellites can be used for flood mapping and assessment, like early warning systems or post-disaster mapping. Okay, uh, after all this theory, we will talk very little about Sentinel-1 satellite and then we will continue to the short demo. In this exercise, we will be using SAR data provided by the Sentinel-1 satellite. The Sentinel satellites are a family of satellites that are included in the space component of the Copernicus program of the European Commission and the European Space Agency. Copernicus is the largest Earth observation program in the world with all its satellite data to be freely available to everyone. The Sentinel-1 mission is formed by a constellation of two twin satellites, Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B, phased at 180 degrees to each other. In December 2021, an anomaly was noticed on Sentinel-1B. We lost contact to the satellite, so we're not having new data anymore. Sentinel-1 is an active sensor working on C-band it includes a right-looking active phased area antenna providing fast scanning in elevation and azimuth and it provides data with a short repeat cycle of six days with different imaging modes. Here you can see the four different acquisition modes of which we will use the IW which is meant for land applications. And here are also the four products of each mode, of which we will work with GRD. Please check the following link at the bottom right uh, side of this slide. Um, as if we want to talk more about this topic, we will need another webinar. Uh, and in this link, you can get some more detailed information about the different acquisition mod modes uh, and the products. Now, as we already said, in this webinar, you will also learn the basics of image processing for flood mapping. First, we will need to search and download the necessary data either from the CreoDS platform or from the Copernicus Open Access Hub. Here are in short the processing steps that will be applied. We will create a graph, a processing chain, where we will insert all the processors we want to use in order to make the raw images editable and able to be used for mapping <coughs> flooded areas. So, let's take them one by one. At the read operator, we will insert the original data. In our case, we will work on four different images, one before the event and the other three during and after it. Next, we will use the subset operator to keep only the small area of interest out of all the area the images initially cover. We will use the apply orbit file operator 
which provides accurate satellite position and velocity information, so that the orbit state vectors in the abstract metadata of the product are updated. Then, we will use the thermal noise removal operator, which will remove the thermal background energy that is generated by the receiver itself. Next, we add the uh, calibration operator. As the level 1 images that we are using, they do not include radiometric corrections, and some significant radiometric bias remains. The radiometric correction now is necessary for the pixel values to truly represent the radar backscatter of the reflecting surface. Then we will use the speckle filter as we want to remove what we call speckle noise, which is noise caused by random constructive and destructive interference of the defaced but coherent return waves uh, when scattered by the elementary scatterers within its resolution cell. Finally, we will add the terrain correction operator so that we correct the geometric distortions of the images. Last, we insert the right operator so that all the processing that will be done using these operators shown here, it will be stored in a final output. Those will be the new images with which we will further proceed in the processing. After these steps, we will use the binarization technique where we will separate the areas that contain water from those that do not, based on the threshold value that differentiate them in each image. And then we will visualize these results in QJS. The methodology based on which we applied this exercise is the one that you see at the very end of this slide and you can find it yourselves as well if you want. So now let's go to the inter-browser to connect to the Innovation Lab. Here we are. We are going to the EU Africa R&D Facility website, which is euafrica-rd.org, and we connect with our account. Just let me go full screen. Okay, here we are. If you click here at the login become a member, you will be able to log in with your account. You already have an account as you have already used it to register for this webinar. So we click login, we connect to our account, and then you can request here at the Innovation Lab, you can request Innovation Lab. When this is ready, if you're eligible, you will have access to it, it will become green, and you will be just able to click on that to open it, as I will do now. Now we're being redirected to Innovation Lab, and this is the landing page we get. You can see that here on the left, we're having all the folders and the structure of this cloud environment. There is a folder called EODATA that in there you can find all the available data that are provided by CREODIAS. I will not focus on this one now because we already have other material regarding this specific part, but I will show you that since some people may not be familiar with that and in order to be able to use all the open source software that we have already available and pre-installed in here, you will click here at the desktop to go to your virtual desktop environment. So here we are, and you can see that we have the Snap Desktop, for example, but there are several other software too. Let me first, and you can actually interact with that as if it's a normal computer, but let me first take you to an internet browser within this cloud environment so that we can search and download the data for the case study we want. If you click on the applications and you go to internet, you will find the Firefox web browser. Which here now we have, as we said, the option to check the data both in CREODIAS and in the Open Access Hub. Let's quickly see in CREODIAS how it looks like. First of all, if you're not familiar at all with that, you need to have an account. I already have an account and I already logged into that. 
In case you don't, you just register first with a simple uh, email and a password and you have access to all the open data available from ESA. In this case, we first need to choose the area of interest, which in our case is Malawi. So we have to zoom in here and what we want is to create a small area of interest around this region that we want to study. So I will go here at the bottom left and I will click Polygon Selection, which means I can just create a polygon that I want here. Double click and you close it. And now you need to set the parameters. At the parameters, we go here at the left and there is some information. What we want to do is to find images acquired before the event, during and after the event. I already know which are the images I want to use. And for this reason, I will show you how to immediately search the image you want if you already know the full name of it at the Open Access Hub after I show you how you can search it here to find which are the images for your area. What you must do is you must set a period here that will refer to the observed date that the product was acquired. In our case, the event was in January 2015. What we're going to do is we will go and search some data that have been acquired a bit further in the past, which was in December 2014. We can go back in time either like that or by simply writing 2014 with the structure it accepts, then the month, which is 12. And then we can set a starting date, for example, uh, 5th of December. And here it goes. It takes us immediately here. And we also need the format. In this format, we need to set the date that we want to be the last one it will search for this data. So in this case, let's just keep it to December, sorry, 14, December 31st. And let's see what results we will get. But this is not enough. This is just the first step. We set the area of interest and the date. What we want to do now is to select here at order product using processors. We want to select Sentinel-1 data. As you can see, there are several data available with coherence of 12 days, 6 days, GRD, etc. We will stop here on the coherence of 6 days. We will select this one. And under here at the show, we will keep the all products option because if you click, you will see there are some which are local products, meaning available to use, and some only offline. I will explain you in a while what offline means. So in our case, we want all products available in the catalog to be displayed. Moving a bit further down, we see that in the collection, we have already selected the Sentinel-1. In the platform, we don't want to choose Sentinel-1A or B. Let's say that we don't know, although we do. In the processing level, we select level 1. Just remember to check out that link I told you about the differences in the levels. And in the product type, we select GRD. As I said again, check out what this ground rate detecting means. The timeliness is something we do not really need to use. Sensor mode, we must check the IW, the interferometric white swath, as I said. And in the orbit detection, you just leave it as it is. We don't want to specify if the orbit will be ascending or descending, meaning if when the satellite was capturing the image was going from north to south, which is descending, or from south towards north, which is ascending. But what we can do to help ourselves is we can select here in the relative orbit number, we can write the orbit 6, which is something I already know because I know which are the images I want to use. If you don't know which are the images, you leave this field empty as well. And for the rest, we do not touch anything else and we are ready. We have set the parameters to click on search and see which data are available during that period. 
you see here that this search returns one result. If you click on that, you will see that you will be uh, allowed to download this product. You just download it and there it is, you have it. But I will not waste more time in here. This is just to show you very quickly. I will leave this page and I will go to the Open Access Hub we have, the Copernicus Open Access Hub, which is this one. In this case, again, you have the map and you have all the available data. Now, again, you go up here. If you don't have an account, you create one here, sign up. If you have one, you just log in. Now that we are logged in, we can go again with the same procedure and zoom in over the area of interest. And here we select this option of switch to navigation mode. And you can draw a polygon and this will be your area of interest. Same way like before, you click here on the left and you have these options where you can insert you can insert the sensing period when you want the data to start uh, being available from until which date again you set the mission to be sentinel one you have the sentinel platform that you don't have to choose if it's going to be a or b the product type that you should specify if you want to limit your search results and also the sensor mode plus the orbit number that we said in this case is six. And why is it important to belong in the same um, orbit? Because if they are not in the same one, they will have different characteristics and we will not be able to work at the same time to all of them. If we leave this for a moment, and if we go now to open here this folder that contains all the information we want, I can show you that I have already created a folder named Flood Mapping with Sentinel-1. And in there, you can uh, use this space as you want for your processes. I have created three folders, one named Original, where I store the original data, one Processing, and one which has the auxiliary data I want to use. If I open the original one, you will see that I have already downloaded four images. The one of 2014 that we showed before, another one which was acquired on the 22nd January during 2015, during the flood had happened, a few days after, where the water was still there. And I have two more images, one on 27th February 2015 and one on 23rd March 2015, where you will actually see how long it takes until all this water from the flood will be removed. So, if I copy, for example, this name of this product, just let me copy the name of the product and I will go to simply paste it over here on the top, as it is. If I click search, immediately it will return this result of this product that is available over this area. Now, if you remember, I mentioned before, and I said something about online and offline products. What is happening is that since there are a lot of data now available and there is not enough space to store them all and have them available to users, every data, every image that was acquired at least one year before the today's date is going to the so-called offline archive so that it is stored in a separate location and it doesn't require um, the storage space that the more new products need. In this case, you see that although the image is from 2014, which is pretty old, it's still available. Why is this happening? There are some images that when they are over uh, areas or cases that are of quite uh, important events, let's say, they remain available for even longer or even permanently. This event was one of the most important that was acquired regarding flats. That's why it is still available. So in this one, 
if you just go over that and you click on this button, which is download product, it will download the product locally in your innovation lab at the downloads folder. And then you can move it to any location you want, as I did here, and I placed it in the original folder. I will not go into more details for that so that we do not lose time. I will now go to show you how this process went and how these products were um, created using Snap and then visualized in QGIS. I have already the information ready to save some time, so I will quickly open the Snap desktop and I will show you what this software is like. You see there are several uh, windows in here. Important window is the Product Explorer window here on the left, where we will insert our data and after, after every processing step, the data will also be shown here. If I go and I just drag and drop each one of the products here on the left, you will see that they are being loaded and they appear here. I just need to do this process, doing them one by one. Otherwise, if I just select them all, they may appear in any sequence, random sequence, uh, it will happen. But in our case, what we want is to have the oldest product first and then according to the sequence that they were acquired. Also down here, you have some other tabs. If you click in the World View tab you have, you will see the location of those images on the map and you will see that all of them are over the exact same area. But as I mentioned in the presentation, this is a quite large image that we do not need all of it. We only need a small area that was flooded in here. For this reason, as I said, we will create a graph. To create the graph and insert all those operators, we click on Tools, Graph Builder, and here it is, it opens. If I expand it a bit, so you see here there is a window on the top where you can insert the operators and for each operator there is a corresponding tab on the half second half of this window. Once you click on each operator, you see that the um, corresponding tab becomes blue. If you want to create a graph, once you open it, you right-click on the right operator and you delete it so that it's deleted from down here because you want to add the operators one by one so that it is reading the sequence properly and it is able to process the data. In this case, I will only show you one example because I have already created the graph and you will follow the exact same uh, procedure if you want. And I will right click on this empty space. I will go to add to raster and I will insert the subset operator, which is the first one we need to insert. Then I will just let my mouse touch here on the right edge, this red arrow that appears. And once it appears, I drag it towards subset. I leave it and it connects the graph. So now, if in the read tab I insert which product do I want, let's take the first one. In the subset, I will be allowed to use all the bands available in that product, insert any parameters I wish according to what's the methodology I want to use, and move on like that to process the data. Now, I will load the graph that I have already created just to show you how it looks like which I have it stored in the auxiliary data in the graphs, which is this one. But as you can see, if on the read we keep, for example, this one, the first product of 2014, if I click run, it will store everything, but only for the one of the four images. But we do not want only one of the four images. We want more, we want all of them. And in order to do that, we have another operator called batch processing, which we will insert this graph that was created. We will also upload those four images. And by clicking only once, it will process the data and we will get all four results very fast 
as the power of this computing environment is quite high and it is making everything much easier and much faster. So if I go to Tools and I open the Batch Processing window, I will load the graph that I mentioned, which is in this folder. And once I load it, you see that all the tabs appear here. I can just now on the uh, input output parameters insert all the opened images already here on the left and they load. But you see all the details. And in this case, I'm not going to go through all the tabs because, as I said, we will not uh, manage to complete this on time. So if I close that, the four new products that will be created will appear here on the left, which are already ready from my side and are these products that I am manually loading now. And I will show you immediately the differences between them. As you can see now, we have here, if I click on the first image, this is the whole image that occupied the area. The correspondent subset we created, which we define the smaller area for that one, is taking only this small space here. If you expand the product, you see it contains a lot of folders and it contains the amplitude and the intensity band. If you double click on each one of them, they will simply be created and they will appear here at the so-called view window of Snap. And now the image is loaded. But this is the original image, which is not orientated properly, which is not having any correction on it, and it's not in a format that we are able to further use. So now that we processed it, if I open the other correspondent image to that, which is this one, I will open the Sigma Knot band that has been created and you immediately see that now the subset is properly orientated, it's terrain corrected, and it contains the information in a, such a status that we can further process the images. For that reason, just let me close all the previous four original images that we do not need to use anymore by selecting them and closing them. Now that we have this image, I will open all the others just to quickly see what are the differences as the first one was acquired before the event and all the others during and after the event. If I go and now I want to see all of them in parallel, I can go here on Windows and tile evenly so that they are all at the same time in my window. But in order to better see them, I will go here on the left to the navigation window, make sure that those two options are selected, and I zoom to all of them. And this is the result that I see. As you can see, on the first left image here is the image before the flood, and the other ones are of the January, of February, and of March. Which means, if we zoom in a bit, you will see clearly that before the event, there was just this small river, let's say. During the event, a few days after, in January, you can see way more water. On February, you see even more water, actually, because water either could not be drained down or it came from other regions too. And you also have on March that we have, again, significant water, but less than that. But okay, this we can see it like that with our eyes, but is, the, is this the official way to say that this is water and this is not water? No. So what we will do now is we will do this binarization that I mentioned, that we will separate the area that is of water and is of not water. For that one, I already have some auxiliary data that I will immediately load here to show you how I chose which areas belong to water and which do not. So by having this option selected, I go here to Vector, Import S3 shapefile, 
and I go here and I import this water mask, this polygon that includes information about which area is water, and I open it. As you see, immediately it appears here. We have chosen and we have said that for sure these areas of interest belong to water, so now we will apply a mask and based on these values, anything that belongs to these values will be considered as water or anything else will be considered as land. Once we apply this step, just let me close them and let me remove them all. Once we apply that, we are now having the new products that are in this folder and if I open them, you will see the result. Again, this is the water mask. And now we have of the original images, we created the subset, and now we're having only this water mask, which is showing in white the areas that correspond to water. Let me do the same for the others as well. Okay, and now that we have them all opened, I will again put them all together to see how they look like. Okay, we have this information. Some of the areas may be wrongly uh, categorized as water, but you can see that in the main parts, we have identified successfully which areas are of water. But what can we do with this information in that uh, level? I would say not much. That's why we exported those data into TIFF files so that they can be used in GIS and we can further make them with color so that we identify which areas have been flooded and when, which belongs to which date. And we can also put a base map, another layer, so that we can see in real time how this looks like on the map. For this reason, I will close this one and I will open the QGIS that I have already prepared here, which will load immediately these results. Here are all of them, which is not something that we really want. So let me load the map. On the background again. Okay, here it is. So let's zoom in a bit in some area. Let's take this area that I have zoomed in now. If I remove all data but I only keep the first one, which is the water mask in December, you can see which areas appear to be of water before the flooding event, and they appear with blue. Then, if I enable the mask of January, you see that all these areas with this yellowish color, they appear to be flooded on January that this image was acquired. If I continue and I enable the mask of February, you see with this red color the extra areas that have even more water. And if I add the mask of March, you see very few purple areas to appear, like if you focus here on the right. If I want to see what is happening only in February, I just deselect the previous ones and you see that February is still detecting these images. Of course, you can choose the sequence that you want the products to be visualized, but you can have an optical result like that. And you can see based on the background that it has, which you can change it, you don't have to choose this one. You can see how well this covers the area. This way, we can easily identify the regions that have been affected and be able to act on time. 
Somewhere here, I will stop with this exercise. I hope that uh, you saw how useful it is to have Innovation Lab and use the open source software and the open and free uh, data from European Space Agency. And now I will go back to the presentation to show you where you can find some uh, future events that we are offering and also how you will find and where this video in our YouTube channel after a few days. Okay, so here we are. And here you can see that you can find our next topics that we are having uh, in the next webinars. You already see the list with the previous ones. So feel free to visit this uh, webpage. And of course, you can find, apart from the webinars, announcements for other upcoming events we're having. Make sure that you also visit this uh, channel we have on YouTube where you will find all the previous webinars plus this one that uh, we are now recording. So let me know if you have any questions. I see some already in the chat. And thank you very much for attending. And you just feel free to contact us in this one, this email address. I can just turn on my camera now and we can have a discussion for anything you may want. Okay, I see first question uh, about easy training data. I think that you probably referred to the shape file that I loaded in Snap. So yes, in that one, we trained the data by choosing an image which was before the event, and we identified which areas used to be of water to make sure that these areas, even after it's flooded, uh, they were still uh, actual areas with water. And this uh, way, all the values that corresponded and were similar to those of the training data, they were classified as water as well to the other images. Sorry, now I think you can see my camera. Sorry for that. Okay. Does anyone else have any other question? Okay, one question is, should we not use drainage capacity to figure out the exact flooded area? Of course, you can do that as well. Uh, what we showed here is very simple and basic, let's say, but if you have the drainage capacity and more information, information about precipitation, about the bedrock, about anything additional you can have, you can use it as well. But with this uh, version, you see that uh, satellite data are a very good tool to assist on that. It's not the only one that we rely to, but we always uh, use this complementary. And in general, for anything you do, just uh, uh, make sure that you are not uh, rely only in one part, let's say, that you have more sources to validate and make sure that your results will be more accurate. Okay, and I see another question. Is it possible to get the information on flood water levels? It really depends on which area you want to study. If there is any authority that has available information about a specific event, of course, you can take it. Otherwise, uh, you have to find a way to obtain this data by yourself. But you can check on uh, European Space Agency or other um, available, uh, like the Copernicus Emergency Management, and you can see what information is already publicly available. Another question is, uh, can Sentinel-2 imagery be used for flood mapping and how is it corrected? Yes, Sentinel-2 can be used in the sense that you will process it uh, as if you are uh, detecting water bodies. The methodology is quite similar uh, with this one used. It's just you have to apply several different operators that correspond to Sentinel-2 images. And regarding correction, 
the best you could do is you can take uh, Sentinel-2 images and Sentinel-1 images and then fuse them and see how well they correlate, which the one is actually uh, complementing the other one. Okay, just for all these questions that I'm already answering, if something is not what you ask or you need additional information, uh, write me again and we can discuss it. Another question is, where did you do the speckle filtering? I mean, I haven't seen uh, on the process. So the speckle filtering was in the graph that I loaded. Of course, I didn't do each step separately because we don't have time to do that. But if you want, you can follow the tutorial I mentioned in the presentation, and you will see when the speckle filter uh, operator is added and which exactly should be the parameters to be used for this specific case and in general, what is suggested for flood mapping. In this processing chain that I had in SNAP, all operators were added and they simply ran at once. So you did not, you were not able to see the intermediate result because I didn't run the processors one by one. Because if I run them one by one, then I store for each step new data. And this will occupy seven or eight times more space on the disk. While running them on a sequence, I just get one final product which skips, let's say, creating and storing the intermediate steps. It just uses it so that it continues to the next one. Okay, we have another question that someone wants to talk about the retrodiffusion coefficient. Does it vary depending on the date of satellite image? I will be honest with you, I'm not sure uh, because I have not really used it, but the logic says that it should vary depending on the date of satellite image. Mostly uh, if the image has been acquired either on descending or ascending pass. I cannot really help you with that right now, but for sure, each image has its own characteristics and given the conditions, it is giving you a different result. So I guess without being 100% sure that yes, it should vary as well. Regarding the question about the recording, yes, everything is being recorded, including now the Q&A session. And in a few days, when it will be ready, it will be also available in the YouTube channel. We have the EO Africa R&D facility. And we have another comment. Uh, would you make webinar on Sentinel-1 and 2 data fusion for different application? I cannot tell you yet, yes or no. It really depends on uh, what are the needs every time. So we are a large team of people who we decide according to what is uh, more um, what is more asked, let's say, what should be uh, offered, when and how. But we will consider it for the future for sure. Thank you for the recommendation. Okay, I see that we are already a few minutes ahead of time. I promise it will be one hour and we are already six, seven minutes more. But uh, if you want, uh, we can stay one more minute maybe if anyone wants to discuss anything else. Let me check. We have a few questions. Yes, we have someone asking to talk about scattering, backscattering of SAR images. This is a quite large topic, actually. And what I can do is uh, if you contact us, we can provide you with some details and some material on uh, more uh, details about backscattering of SAR images. Because there is a, there are a lot of, um, there is a lot of theory behind of what can affect it, how you can correct it uh, and everything. It's not something, unfortunately, I can cover right now that fast. Uh, 
Another question is, why didn't you consider a specific satellite direction ascending or descending? Actually, uh, I did, if this is the full question. Uh, we only chose uh, the passes that were ascending in this case, because when you want to work with several data over the same area, they all must be of the same pass. If they have different geometry, if some of them are ascending, some descending, you cannot process them because the pixels will not match. So in this case, it was only ascending. Another question is, uh, how can we find the Sentinel and Landsat fusion result? So what you can do is you can process both uh, data coming from both sources separately. And once you reach up to the level that they become a T file, for example, or the, the last step after you perform the basic processing in each one separately, then you can combine them and fuse them. But not before you apply the steps that each one requests. Okay. And I think uh, the last question that we can talk about uh, today is what is the difference between VV and H8? These are the polarizations. VV means uh, vertical and vertical, HA means horizontal and horizontal. It means that when the satellite, when we are sending the beam, it is sending it at a vertical direction. And when it is receiving it, it is receiving it in vertical as well. While horizontal is when it's sending it on horizontal direction, orientation, and it receives it back on H, horizontal again. You can have even combinations that, for example, VH, it is sending in vertical and receiving and horizontal. Again, like the backscatter, this is a quite large topic that we can discuss and there is plenty of material. And if you wish, you can let us know and we can provide you some details on how to see uh, how they work and why different combinations are more efficient for different applications. Like in our case for flats, it's more efficient when you have the VV polarization. Okay. Uh, yeah, if it would have impacted the mapping the flood, I guess you mean if we were using a different polarization than VV. Yes, you would have a slightly different results because it really depends on the orientation and how the satellite is passing over the area. But if you want, you can test it and you will easily understand uh, what is the optical result at the end. For sure, there are changes and there is nothing, there is no, no one solution for everything. Every time you can try more and see what works better. But in principle, VV works better for flooding, for flooded areas. Okay, I see some questions coming. So if anyone wants to leave, feel free, but I would like to discuss about the questions that are coming. Let's uh, offer a few more minutes. Uh, a question is, uh, how can we represent, how we can to represent with the plot, the variation of floods on a long time series date, if we want to show this one on the plot? When you mean plot, you mean to see them like in a graph or uh, you want to see the information uh, on a map? I'm not sure what you mean by plot. Just standard plot like a line of uh, values of points. If you mean that one, you can extract the pixel value of each pixel and you can then create a normal graph uh, in uh, Excel or any other software that is processing these values. And you can have different lines, let's say, of the different events, and this is your result. Okay, uh, another question is, uh, can we do the processing only using SNAP or there is also other open source softwares? Uh, what we suggest for Sentinel data is SNAP, 
because majority of the other softwares are uh, commercial. But of course, we have also another webinar, if I'm not wrong, the second one of the series, if you go to the channel we have, that was about uh, open source toolboxes and software available for processing. And just uh, now that we're here, if anyone wants to ask a question uh, and speak, uh, you can just let us know and we can unmute you and we can have a discussion. Yes, someone wants to explain a bit about masking water. So uh, when, you when we had the image, we had the image that contained all the area with the normal um, soil, let's say, and vegetation, plus the flooded area. What we wanted was to extract only the pixels that correspond to water so that we can take them and we can put them in another layer in GIS so that we visualize on this actual uh, area as it is today, how these will, um, will look if we keep only the pixels that correspond to water. So for this reason, instead of exporting all the images we had from um, Snap, we exported parts of this image, which is those pixels. And how did we do that? By creating a mask, let's say. I will not uh, call it subset, but it's actually as if you are subsetting the image by keeping only this uh, area that correspond to water. Just how the terminology goes uh, for this processing stuff. And how we mask that is, as I said, we trained some data. We went to an image which was acquired before the event. And we created polygons saying that in this area, these pixels has some values. These values correspond to the backscatter you receive when there is water. So find any other values within this image I give you that are from this range of a number up to that one of uh, backscattering, and then identify them as water. And that's how you create the mask. We had to run uh, one uh, process called band maths, which in SNAP, it is calculating these values that are in the available band of each image. Another, email, another question is, can Sentinel-1 be used for land cover classification? Yes, it can. And there are some available data, um, free data online. If you just search about land cover classification using Sentinel-1, you will find it. For that one, you just usually need some uh, supporting data, some validation data, and some data that will uh, indicate you uh, which area is uh, about land, what type of land, actually. Plus, if I'm not wrong, there are some available um, layers within SNAP about the uh, land cover. Maybe they're quite old, but they're still working well. Another question a bit more specific to soil moisture is, can Sentinel-1 be used to determine soil moisture index? Because most journals are saying it only determines surface soil moisture using OPTRA model. I'm not sure what you mean as soil moisture in your case, but what I can tell you is that with Sentinel-1, we can identify the moisture the soil has up to the first five centimeters depth. I don't know if this is helping, but yes, this is what Sentinel-1 can, uh, can measure for soil moisture. And of course, as I said before, we will not rely only on the satellite. Ideally, if you know when the satellite is passing over the area of interest, you can also go and take sample of the soil, measure in the lab the moisture, and then take the values you get from the satellite and actually calibrate your results. Another question is about the polarization. And the question is, the polarization HV and VH are the same? No, they are not, because it has to do with how it sends the beam and how it receives it. So in HV, it is sending it in horizontal and it's receiving it in vertical. 
while on the other one, it is sending it in vertical and receives it in horizontal. And the question continues, uh, which of the two is better for the monitoring of floods hazard? Usually we prefer to have the same polarization when we monitor them, when we monitor uh, floods. Ideally is the VV, otherwise you should get V8, but uh, H8, sorry. But in case you have available only HV and V8, I would suggest to take the, the V8, see if it is working, because it has to do with when you send the beam at the vertical uh, component. It's, it can become quite complicated actually, because this is a bit detailed, but uh, if I want to be 100% honest with you, you have, in case you have different polarizations, you have to test what works on the area of interest you have. Depends a lot also on the geographic uh, latitude that this belongs. And other parameters, what's the surrounding? It's not uh, a question that there is only one answer. Okay, another question is, you suggested VV polarization works better in the application of flood monitoring, but isn't the flooded area would be smooth surface, which will backscatter very less signal. And that would be true for most of the other polarization. Not exactly. In theory, the way you put it, yes. But if we want to be sure that we are not uh, having any issues and we don't mistake other areas, which could act as if they are water, it is safer to take the VV because it has to do with what type of vegetation you have, what type of um, soil or rock you have, if it may be, uh, what's the, the time of the year actually, what is the condition that created the flood? Because as we said, the flood cannot be created only from precipitation purposes. But imagine that it's raining in the generic area and everything around is quite uh, wet and moist. So it can create some uh, complications. Another question is, if, can we find step-by-step -step procedure for this webinar to process our data for flood mapping? Yes, once this uh, webinar will be available on YouTube, you can go back again and see in the presentation I gave you, which is the link and the source that you can take this uh, tutorial, which has step-by-step -step everything you need. Plus you can even get the auxiliary data available for this specific exercise. Okay, I think I will reply to these last two questions and then we should, uh, we should close because it's quite late. So another question is, how does the water mask of Sentinel-1 perform compared to thermal channels of Sentinel-3? If you mean in general, or if you mean uh, in this specific case, what I can only tell you is that for this application, we are working. Uh, I'm not sure that the thermal channel of Sentinel-3 could be helpful for this specific case. Uh, in general, we don't compare performances of different satellites because each one is having its uh, own uh, instruments and they cannot be easily compared. Otherwise, they wouldn't be on a different uh, satellite, <laughs> if I can say it like that. And the last question is, is there any possibility of one getting high resolution images from your website uh, like World View 2? So anything that is open source uh, is available in this Creo Diaz. Also, if you go in the catalog, you will see which are the other data that Creo Diaz, this platform is collaborating with. So you can uh, receive, you can download those data too. If World View 2, belongs in this category, in this list, you can download it. If not, you can just simply contact individually the people providing them and receive them. This is unfortunately the only way. But in case any of the answers uh, you received does not satisfy you because we don't have a lot of time and you want to go into more details, 
feel free, as I said, to contact us in this email, info at eoafrica-rd.org, and we will come back to you with anything you may need to know. Uh, so, uh, I think that maybe here we can uh, close this webinar. I would like to thank you again very much for joining and for the very interesting questions. I hope this webinar to have met the expectations you had. And feel free to follow future activities we're offering from this platform. Have a nice day, evening, night, everyone. Bye-bye.